Hi, Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from upstage left at the Highfield Theatre. Welcome to Backstage, a week in review of work being done by our talented design and production students. Let's see what they've been working on. Kristen Knudsen, Production Manager and Technical Director. The design and production team has been focused this week on the world of costuming. They had a workshop earlier with costume professionals Nancy Leary, Sasha Richter, and Anna Light, which you'll see some clips of. Then they broke into three teams to focus on developing a wearables project. So I say wearables because it may not actually be a costume, it may be very prop-like, it may be almost like scenery, but the parameters were that it had to be an object that was worn on the body, inspired by a selection of shows I offer the students. These wearables projects take their inspiration from a few musicals that make a nod to show business. So please sit back and enjoy what the design and production team has prepared for you this week. I started out uh, with a, a degree in sociology and anthropology, so in the humanities. Uh, and um, so that's kind of my basic background. And I took a year off and decided to go back into theater. And what I, the, the program that I went into is a technically based a theater program um, and we did some design and some art classes and stuff like that but I, I kind of spent a lot of time after that working in technical theater as in draping or stitching or firsthand or you know I ran a couple of shops I did some wardrobe I did all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and then I got married and had a kid so I took a little bit of a break I moved to a different country um, and I went back to uh, get my master's when I was a little bit it was later in my 30s so I was a little bit older and actually Anna and I were students together you were an undergrad and I was a grad student um, and uh, that was also in technical with a technical background but I really j just design now I started designing when I graduated and I I did some design before but um, now it's primarily in opera uh, and I just it just sort of happened that way I thought I'm going to graduate and be the best tailor in the country. <laughs> and then I started designing and then I was like, okay, well, I could do, I could do both. And I actually teach both. Um, but uh, it was, a, you know, going into theater, you kind of have to be open to all kinds of experiences, you know, with all kinds of people and to see that it's a building block. Uh, one thing that you do uh, builds on the other, the next opportunity that you get, and it, it will and it will lead you somewhere. So I was actually going to be a art therapist. I was a fine arts painter when I was like towards the end of my high school career. And then I was always designing the costumes in high school, which I'm sure most of you probably experienced when you were, led you down this path. Um, and then I, just sort of a friend was like, I just really think you should do this. So I applied to BU, which where I met Nancy and Anna and Mark. Um, and I majored in costume design there. And after finishing out there, I took a year and I did design work between New York and Boston, kind of back and forth. And then I wasn't really sure. It was really hard, you know, that point of my career. It was like, people would be like, here's $200, can you give us the world? And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, like it was just so hard. Um, and so i have been doing a lot of my own millinery work, which was like the, the technical aspect of what BU kind of did for us, which was like, I was always good at craft work and things like that. So I was doing millinery work for my own shows and I had lots of pictures of all the things I had done. And a friend was like, I'm working on this show and TV, would you come out for an interview? They just need someone to like clean up hats for a bit. So I was like, sure, yeah, 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 do whatever. So I like came with my portfolio and showed them and they were like the two designers and ended up being Boardwalk Empire, which I worked on for five seasons as their milliner. And they were like, oh my gosh, like she can do all these other things. That's like amazing. And, and I was just kind of like, I'll take any job. I'll do, you know, whatever. So I ended up getting into film, getting into the union um, that way. And so I sort of like left theater for, you know, like a bit. I will do people's like friends shows every now and then, which is really awesome to have the opportunity to pull things. Um, and after Boardwalk, I uh, the designer that was on Boardwalk was like 
you know, you have this whole background in like design, you'd be great at doing background fittings. So then I did background fittings for about three years on several different shows, um, on The Deuce, on um, Marvelous Miss Maisel, um, you know, just throughout the years to different like period shows. Cause that's what I ended up being like good at. And people were like, oh yeah, she knows how to do that, you know? And then in the last couple of years, I sort of transitioned, got a little tired of the background people. They're lovely people, but you know, there's a lot of kookiness there. And I needed a little break and a friend was like, well, you should do truck work, you know, like, and be like Prince. It's like, sounds like truck work, but you're like setting and preparing like principal costumes for the day, working with designers and you're working in the whole principal world, which is like, you know, it's, it's just like a different, path but the cool thing about film for me has been like anytime I felt like I needed a break or a transition to something else there's been like a different course of what costuming is which has been like good for my personality you know um I had always wanted to go into costuming even in high school I knew um I learned how to sew when I was really young and then um when I realized you could be a costumer either a designer or a technician um I knew instantly that's what I want to do. So that path has always been there for me. Um, went to BU, chose BU, I say, because it was alphabetically. When I looked up costume design, Boston University was the first one alph alphabetically. So I was like, great, I'll apply there. Um, I don't remember if that's actually true or not, but I think. Anyway, um, I studied costume production at BU. So I don't do the design side of things. I do the draping and the technical aspect of stuff. I've I've designed maybe three shows in my career. I don't, that's not my goal. I'm there to support the designer. So after BU, I did my undergrad there and then I actually stayed on at BU to do my master's degree. And during the time I was doing my master's degree, uh, I worked at Boston College as the costume shop manager. I was there three years. After I got my master's in costume production, I left BU and I went to work at a small school in Pennsylvania. I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, and I was there about three years, then um, got married and moved with my new, new husband, my husband to New York where he was going to grad school. So it was, um, and Sasha had already been in New York. Lots of people were working in New York that I had gone to school with from BU, but I'd never been there myself and frankly was like, pretty intimidated by New York at first when I got there because I didn't know it just felt big and scary and intimidating Boston was a much more manageable environment mm -hmm. um and then I actually worked at a little luckily I had a job when I left um when I was at DeSales University I also worked for the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival which I don't know if any of you have heard of it's a it's a big-ish um regional theater um uh, somebody I met at the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Festival hooked me up with a job at a little tiny theater that actually doesn't exist anymore in New York called The Pearl. So I was the shop manager at The Pearl for about a year, for most of us, like about a year I was there. Um, and then after that, through coincidentally meeting somebody at a party roundabout, I um, applied for and got the job as the draper at the New York City Ballet. Um, which was a completely new experience for me. I'd only ever done theatrical costuming. Um, I'd never made, I mean, I'd made a few dance costumes uh, um, a little bit, but not a lot. And so I got really thrown right into the middle of like, here's your first day, here's a pile of unitards. Like you need to cut them and make them by lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. um, in the early years of your career are the connections that will help you get work for many, many years. Of like incorporating almost everything in the yeah. costume shop world. Uh, but one, the one thing that I did discover when I started doing opera is that opera is, is large. <laughs> I mean, you know, plays can be pretty large and musicals as well, but opera usually you always, you usually have a chorus and you have a bunch of principals uh, with all kinds of ranges of body sizes. And that's really interesting. Um, it's different than in acting. Um, and also that you're creating in opera, you're creating images on a grand scale. Like I, I always think of the whole thing. What, what does everyone look like on the stage as a whole? When you don't, you normally wouldn't do that with a play. You're, you're thinking about the intimacy of the play and the connection between 
the character and the story and the audience. Um, and you, there still is a connection in opera, but it's on a grander scale. So that is something that I had to learn. And, and I've worked with Anna and we've all worked with each other. And it's like, I, you can finish each other's sentences. Mm -hmm. And if you can like translate that to working for other people, I mean, the designer for Boardwalk Empire, Lisa Padovani, ended up being one of my closest, dearest friends, like to this day. And she took me and she was the one who was like, I think you'll be good at fittings and just like, you know, took me along with her. But we had this like very good intimacy of like, I could end up finishing her sentences. But I think part of it, when I first met her, she was terrifying. She was so terrifying. I'd walk up and I'd be like, do you like how I made this? That, she still makes fun of me to this day, how I talked to her. Cause I was so nervous to like communicate with her about design. And she'd kind of be like, she like egged me on too. She'd be like, yeah, it's great. Like remember right back to what, you know, she was doing. But our relationship ended up like really creating this like bond that made it like easy to speak to each other. Towards the end, we had our own little language. She'd be like, can you put a little padoodle on that hat? And I'd be like, I know what you're talking about when I remember it. And I'd like, you know, I would like do that, you know? And, and it was because I could be very humble with like what I was creating for her or for anyone else. And it's like, don't you want your best friend in your room when you're like talking about like the art you're making or something you're making and, and, and to not feel nothing good ever was created by someone else making you feel stupid or bad about it. You know? I, I also had an idea of like, um, creating like merchandise sort of things inspired by oh. song characters. Like what would be sold at the theater. That would be, thing. that's actually oh, that would be cute. I like cool. that. Cause then like, you know, people like, um, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like an example. Like, um, people would love to buy Janice's jacket from Mean Girls if they sold yeah. it at the yeah. Um, yeah, and so like, like how people for Les Mis, they buy the little uh, pins, the yeah. revolutionary pins. Yeah. Um, so like maybe, I don't know, like there's a part, the part in the show where they play the, play the girls as cellos. Probably not the best idea, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. a sweatshirt that looks like a cello or something like that. I don't, <laughs> but like picking a few songs or characters and making, or like drawing something that. Yeah. Merchandise to sell, maybe? So for this project, I kind of struggled a little bit, mostly because I didn't have any materials on me. But when my group got together again, we decided to go down the merch route, which led to way more avenues. And I started on Pinterest, which is really my favorite place to go for basic research. Which is where I ended up finding this Hamilton palette. And I thought, mm, makeup is wearable. And that's pretty much where it went. So then I moved over to my iPad and started uh, working on a basic cover design. I ended up really liking it. It was pretty cute. It's heavily inspired by the original poster. over to painting, which was a relatively uninteresting process, mostly because I had to watch paint dry, quite literally. I used gouache this time. If I were to do it any differently, I'd probably do acrylic or put some kind of gesso or a layer underneath to keep it from cracking because now it's not sitting too well in the cover. Which is unfortunate, but yeah. Here is painting the insides, and uh, at some point I tried removing the the eyeshadows from the pan, but it didn't work. So I just let it be and was very careful. Would not recommend. But yeah, that's what it ended up looking like.
And since it is a wearables project, I did have to show it on myself. So I did a 30s makeup look that Polly, if she wore makeup, or any of the Follies would have worn. So yeah, enjoy. This was the final look. I hope you enjoy.
So for my portion of the project, I decided to make a collection of pins that would be sold as merchandise. So I began trying to draw the girls as cellos in the show because that was my favorite part when I was watching a version of the show, but I just couldn't draw it the way I liked it. So then I tried to draw the cello on a digital drawing version. I'd never done digital drawing before and that just didn't work either. So I went back to pen and pencil and I went back to my good old friend watercolor and this actually worked a lot better for me. The first pin I drew was inspired by the song Embraceable You in the show and I just liked it because it was the love interest duet that Bobby and Polly sang together and I thought that would be cute to have as a pin. And the next pin I drew was inspired by the Zangler Follies that appear in the show. They're the dancers who show up like the Zigfield Follies. They have headdresses, they're dressed pretty, and so I thought it'd be nice to have a headdress pin for them. And the last pin I decided to create is based off the song Slap That Bass. It's a really big number in the show and it's one of my favorites, so I wanted to draw something for it in some way. So I decided to make a bass cello and write Slap That Bass around it. And so my thought process when I was creating these designs and picking out what I was actually going to take from the show to inspire my creativity and inspire my designs, I put on my marketing cap. And I thought, what would the audience want to wear on their bags or their jackets to commemorate seeing this show? So I thought that these three designs would actually be very fun to show off. And I think pins are very popular right now. It's a very easy way to express yourself and tell people what your interests are just on your clothes or on your bags. So I think that this would be a very successful merchandise product that any audience member would want to take home. And what you were watching me paint this whole time was actually the backing of where the pins would go. So everything is all themed to the show. I think the pins look really nice. Obviously they wouldn't be made on paper like this, but this is the base design that the pins would then be manufactured into. I love them. I would wear them. I would definitely buy them. I'm a sucker for pins and stickers and all that stuff. I hope you all enjoyed watching me paint and I'll see you next week.
my name is Thomas J. Charles and for this project I designed Annie Oakley's very first costume for Annie Get Your Gun. Uh, in the script it says that Annie Oakley is dressed in buckskin and looks like a true frontiers woman, but obviously buckskin wasn't something that I had access to so I decided to make everything out of fabric. In trying to decide what she might wear, I went back to the seven questions that Stanislavski asks actors that I mentioned last week in my independent project. So, who are they? Where are they? When is it? What do they want? Why do they want it? How are they going to get it? And what must they overcome? And for this project, I really looked at who Annie Oakley was. and. It's interesting because, you know, a woman in this time period would have been expected to dress a certain way, but because she is so far removed from uh, gender norms in society because of her lifestyle, it presents a really, really interesting um, juxtaposition. So in my initial rendering, I decided that I wanted to give her um, a pair of really, really flared pants, the kind of pants that you look at and you think it's a skirt and then they start moving and it's actually a pair of pants because a woman in this time period would have been wearing a skirt rather than pants, but Annie most definitely would have had like buckskin chaps on rather than um, a full skirt. So I, but because this was being translated into fabric rather than uh, in fur, I wanted to sort of play with that silhouette. I wanted to keep um, the pleats. There's this, in almost every picture of Annie Oakley, her skirt that she's wearing, um, which is from later in her life, is pleated at the at the waistline and I really wanted to carry that detail over so I did include that in my rendering and then I also found uh, for the top I was really inspired by a picture of Calamity Jane um, she has this jacket vest thing uh, that has buttons all the way down the side and I really really liked the asymmetry of that so I knew that I wanted to incorporate it into my design and you'll notice that the rendering isn't in color that's because I was rather limited uh, with the fabric that I had at home so this was sort of a matter of you know rendering it up but knowing sort of what my fabric was um, so I didn't actually add any color to this rendering because I knew what I knew that I, I knew I had the fabric in mind it wasn't like I was gonna have to go and select fabric for this project so before I even got to constructing the costume, I actually, I actually uh, cut the idea of doing pleats. I decided that pleats would have been way too finicky for Annie at this point in the story. So I wanted to play around with this idea of doing like a paper bag pant, um, something that was clearly oversized for her, just cinched in at the waist. So that's sort of where I got uh, where I started heading with, with the pants. And I chose uh, this pattern that had a really, really flared leg to give that sort of skirt-like silhouette while giving, um, while still get being pants. And then for the vest top, I chose something that had like an asymmetrical wrap to it. And then I just extended the front, uh, front portion up so that it came all the way up to the collarbone on both sides. As I was cutting fabric, I realized that I didn't actually have enough of all of the like tablecloth fabric that I wanted to use for the top. So I ended up incorporating this really interesting um, horse fabric, which I think kind of looks like curtains. It was the kind of thing that Annie might have had lying around her house, either as a pillow or a blanket or a, or a set of curtains, and then a tablecloth that she just uh, turned into into some clothing. When I started constructing the pants, um, I made them all up and then the paper bag idea was really, really throwing me for a loop. So I ended up just doing like, um, like a drawstring inside the waistband to have some cinch so that the pants weren't super, super big. I did want them to be relatively fitted to, to the waist, but so that Annie could still move around in them. This is not something, she's not the type that wears clothing for fashion. She's the type that wears clothing because it's practical. Um, so it was really important that things fit her and they weren't going to fall off as she was um, hunting, but they didn't need to be like super, super form fitting or anything like that. And then as I was doing the top, I realized that um, it was actually fortunate that I didn't have enough of that tabletop 
the, that tablecloth check because I actually I realized that I didn't like the fabric um, so a lot of what it was is trying to figure out how to balance it and I, I added the bias tape um, around the armholes and the top of the of the vest to sort of add that like level of continuity to sort of draw all the fabrics together um, but then I let a little bit of the horse fabric peek out um, underneath where uh, it where it was overlapping and then I added the um, this little pouch pocket thing um, partially because I, up to that point Annie didn't have any pockets in any of her clothing and I think that would be something that was really important to her to have somewhere to put whether it's just shot or what she killed or anything you know just to carry with her as she was hunting it also helped to break up there was so much green in the pants um, and as much as I wasn't a fan as I fell out of love with like that table check um, it was at least interesting to look at because there were different colors and different gradients um, Whereas that green fabric is actually a lining fabric, um, but it's, it's the green that I had. Uh, so it's it's very flat and there's very little texture to the fabric at all. Um, and it's just all one color. So I, I used the pouch to sort of add some visual interest and again, some asymmetry um, to the lower half of the look. And then I finished the whole thing off with this awesome pair of brown combat boots that my sister had lying around that I think would be something that Annie would definitely wear um, as she was hunting in the woods. You can say I can say softer. I can say Annie can softer than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. I can drink my liquor faster than liquor. I can drink it quicker and get even sicker. For this week's project, our group decided to bring Lily from Kiss Me Kate into the 21st century. I started with some historical research and some vintage inspired research on dressing gowns because I wanted to create a dressing gown for Lily. I started playing with some tulle uh, with different colors and different layering and I came up with this first draft of a dressing gown and tulle. I really liked this piece but I thought I, I could do more with it and I felt that it more closely represented a concept for a red carpet gown so I followed that path because I thought maybe this version of Lily would also have a pretty fancy red carpet gown. I began with more tulle and more colors. The first draft was four layers of tulle and two colors. This is four colors of tulle and eight layers. I once again played around with how to put the tool on my dress form and ended up sort of with a backwards version of the first draft so it was sort of like a strapless gown with a large train and I really like how the differences in the sides of the layering and you can tell the difference between the two from the top to the bottom I also found these really pretty paper flowers that nice went really nicely with the color palette of this dress. Here's a close-up of the train just so you can see the different layers. Once I was finished with the dress, I was sort of, I really liked how it looked, but I wanted some other element that was attention grabbing and special about it. So I found this necklace that is gold and has pearls and figured out a way to arrange it on the dress to add some cool detail to it. And I really like how it all fits together. 
I also am really happy that I got to use my little dress form that I made last week because otherwise this project would have been completely different and nearly impossible. Hi, my name is Valerie Stebbins, and for the wearables project, for the design side of things, we had to work with the show Kiss Me Kate as inspiration for something wearable on the body of any of the characters or just maybe something people would wear now. Um, me and my team decided to go with Lily slash Kate, and we decided to create something that could be from this time period. Maybe it's her in the dressing room, or maybe it's a piece she's wearing on stage, or maybe it's her streetwear. Um, so I decided to actually create some jewelry for her. I've never created jewelry before, I've never like dug into this world, so it was kind of fun to just like poke around and see what was up. Um, so I created this necklace for her that I could see her wearing on stage. Um, as like being her character and then coming off the stage and wishing that she kept and she could wear on her like carpet events or whatever she does on a day-to-day -day basis um so i created this kind of like big flower like brass like brass looking kind of gold-ish um kind of brooch that has pearls that are stringed uh right up and around the neck um, so it kind of like holds on here and then the brooch would be right here and it has one other connecting piece to the side I picked this flower because I just I was going through inspiration photos and I saw this brooch that was a beautiful flower And I was like for some reason this just connects to the character why I really don't have an explanation that's too good why I could probably go into a million different random rabbit holes about why it was correct but I feel like the explanation if I just felt it was right is it. Um, but these are also pieces that are super from the time period. Um, they were more wearing like a lot of pearl and a lot of like one string. The structure of it is more 21st century um, than what they would have worn when this was like 1940s. Um, so that's kind of what it was. I kind of wanted to clash the 21st century with some 1940 elements so the elements that were like the 1940s is the pearls and like the brooch and things but then you come back with like this weird structure that wouldn't have been worn which is something I really really like about this piece and that's something that also reminds me of like Lily and Kate she's such like a 21st century woman but at the same time like still stuck in the 1940s um and that's kind of what I wanted to bring to life here so I hope you enjoy it. I'm happy I got to dive into this world for 10 seconds. And yeah, thank you very much. My name's Maddie Boshin, and for this week's wearables project, I decided to create a modern reimagining of the character Lily Vanessi from the musical Kiss Me Kate. Lily Vanessi is a elegant, well put together, and hot tempered woman living in 1948, and I decided to use the time period as inspiration for a more modern take on something that she might wear. So here it is. In my research, I found that a lot of dresses from the earlier 1940s featured masculine details, including button-up tops, there were a lot of wrap tops, collars, shoulder pads, but by the later 1940s, when Kiss Me Kate takes place, um, a lot of styles were being influenced by Christian Dior's new look that debuted in 1947 with more voluminous skirts that were popular in the 1950s. 
In looking at modern fashion, some details from the 40s that I found in modern fashion were these puffed sleeves as well as wrap dresses and an emphasis on the waist to create more of an hourglass figure. Using these ideas as inspiration, I decided to create a two-piece matching set, a combination of blouse with puff sleeves and a longer skirt in a red floral pattern, which is actually characteristic of the 1940s. I think that this design um, really well captures Lily Vanessi as a more modern woman in something that a young actress like herself might wear today. Backstage is part of our larger programming Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in again next week for another installment of Backstage. <laughs>